What is up guys, Technicals here. Today we're going to be going through Zethron's guide on how to create one of these undervolt dongles for your FPGA. This is a DC 161.3A. It's a device used to interface with the card so you can modify voltages and do some other things. All the details are over on Zethron's site. We're not going to get into the actual configuration or usage of this device, really just how to make it because you have to splice this device in with an adapter cable because this device as it comes does not connect to your FPGA. So you have to splice in one of these small adapter cables. Very simple process, but I think a lot of people versus going off of a guide uh, just want to see it in action. So I went ahead and tried it out, and I'm going to take you through that process with me today. I'm The Technicals. Let's get into it. The Technicals. All right, guys, so today we're going to be taking a look at the undervolt dongle for the VCU-1525 using the DC-1613A uh, device from Linear Technologies. For this, you're going to need the DC-1613A dongle. You're also going to need the adapter cable that allows you to connect it to your FPGA, a soldering iron, some solder, and a few little other accoutrements. All credit to Zethron for this guide, just like the uh, the guide for the VRM cooler on the back of the card. If links in the description below over to the guide off Zethron's site. If you want to follow along on the PDF, I'm just going to be following the guide here uh, to do it. First thing you're going to want to do is line up the two cables that you're going to be splicing together. The DC1613A has a red cable on the far edge. You're going to want to line that up with the red cable with the adapter. And uh, when you're going to mate them together, you're going to be using a sort of a key to make sure you splice together the correct wires. Now, Zethron has this on his PDF. Uh, it's a hand-drawn one. I went ahead and updated it here to make it maybe a little bit easier to take a look at. So once you snip off the ends, you're going to want to separate the wires. The adapter cable has very teeny tiny wires, near as I can figure it's something in the... Uh, possibly the 30-ish gauge range of wire. It's very, very small. So if you don't have a wire stripper capable of stripping wires down to that level, you're going to have to do it with a pair of snips or possibly with a blade. Uh, go ahead and separate each wire with a blade, cutting down the middle and then pulling them apart as fine as you can. I used a set of tweezers included in my soldering kit to separate these wires. You want to give yourself at least uh, a few inches or in at least an inch or two of lead uh, so you have plenty of room to solder so you're not impacting the other wires. Next thing you're going to want to do the exact same thing on your DC1613A. Go ahead and separate the wires and strip off the ends. It is recommended to wear nitrile gloves while you're doing this so the oils on your skin do not touch the wire and prevent a good solder. Now the wire strippers I have here are pretty cheap from Lowe's. They're not really made for uh, any type of fine electronics work. I was able to use them with some some success on the DC 1613A's wires because they are a little bit larger. Uh, the cable, the wires on the adapter cable are far too fine, and I had to use snips to uh, very, very carefully strip the sheathing off of those wires. Again, be very careful with this. You don't want to remove any wire that could prevent uh, a good signal from coming through. You want to keep all your wires intact. So once you have all your wires separated and stripped, you're going to get into soldering. I recommend watching a few other YouTube videos on how to do this. It's been about 20 years since I've soldered anything, and so I did practice a little bit on some old Molex cables earlier. My solder job here is quite sloppy, so before you fire into the comments about how terrible of a solder job it is, uh, this is mostly for illustrative purposes so people can see the guide in action. So I started out with the first wire trying to put a piece of shrink tubing on one side of the wire. The idea being is once I'm done soldering it, I can move the sheathing over top of it and then use a heat gun to shrink the tubing over it. Unfortunately, the wires are so incredibly small, uh, getting a good piece of tubing on there proved to be quite difficult. So instead of doing that, I just ended up putting electrical tape around each soldering point. For the splice itself, I didn't use a, uh, a mesh splice. I used more of a, what I think is called a lineman splice. That's where you twist the wires together and then kind of ball them up. And then for the solder work itself, I know it's recommended to heat up the wire significantly and uh, have the solder drip down into the wires themselves versus touching the, uh, the tip of the soldering iron to the solder itself. Unfortunately, when I was trying to heat up the wires, it started to uh, sort of melt the sheathing on the wire itself. So what I would do is I would heat up the wire a little bit, and then just to get the process started, go ahead and drip off a piece of solder into the wires themselves, and then use the soldering tip to keep that hot while I fed in more solder. Now it doesn't take a lot because these are very small wires, so uh, just a little bit, maybe an inches, inch worth of this very narrow solder seemed to do the trick. 
So follow along with the guide, being sure to match up the correct wires uh, to each side because, again, once you solder it, it's done. After you have it all in place, it's recommended you use heat shrink tubing to seal up each solder point. I used electrical tape here, so all you have to do is make sure you close it up very well. I put one large piece of heat shrink tubing over the entire cluster, uh, shrunk it in place, and we are good to go. So that's it guys, very simple process to uh, solder these two things together. It's been a long time since I had soldered anything, uh, but it was very fun to get back into the groove of it. Hopefully I can start soldering you know, things all around the house just to, uh, just to keep doing it because it is a lot of fun. So I'd love to know what you think in the comments below. Do you already have one of these for your FPGA? What kind of results do you get from it? Uh, hopefully I can get my FPGA back here soon. Hopefully it's not dead and I can uh, actually use this thing. Don't forget to check the description below for everything we talked about here today. I'm the Technicals. See you next time.